Hi there. So we're going to talk a little bit here about mammal physiology. So aspects of mammal bodies that help kind of differentiate them from other animals. So again, as we're saying here, mammals are different. When we compare mammals and even some of their ancestors, like what we see up here, the synapsida or mammal-like reptiles, we see many physical features that are different from other groups of animals on Earth. These help to facilitate feeding strategies and a high metabolism. Again, this is part of what makes mammals a little bit different from other groups of animals. So one of the first things that we look at is the fact that mammals, by and large, are heterodont. Heterodont means different teeth. Again, hetero meaning different, dot meaning tooth. Most mammals have teeth with different shapes. Most non-mammalian vertebrates have teeth with the same shape, which is being homodont. So heterodont, again, we're looking here at this example on the left. That's kind of a good example of mammalian teeth. Homodont here on the right, kind of a good example of maybe either a reptilian animal or something else that would have very similar teeth all through the jaw. <clears throat> Differently shaped teeth allow for multiple tooth functions. These can help with increasing food variety, hunting strategies, or self-defense. So again, even if we think about our own teeth, each of the different types of teeth that we have serves a different function with how we eat food. So again, this is an evolutionary advantage to have this variety in terms of teeth. When we start to talk about, and let me move my video here so we can get a little bit more of a better view of our skull here. So when we talk about these tooth arrangements, we're talking about the dental formula of an animal. Comparisons of the types of teeth in a mammal, the top portion for the upper jaw and the bottom portion for the lower jaw. So again, that's when we're looking at these types of diagrams that talk about the dental formula. Dental formulas track the number of incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. Modern mammals can be described by a dental formula. Usually you will find something that gives you these numbers for most modern day mammals. So if we're looking at humans as an example, and again we're just looking at our teeth, and you can kind of double check this with your own teeth, um, on the top part two incisors on one side, so one side upper jaw, two incisors on the lower, one canine, both upper and lower, two premolars, both upper and lower, three molars, both upper and lower. And again, this would be different for other types of animals, but this is the dental formula for um, humans and certain great apes. Another structure that we'll talk about that's kind of related to digestion is the cecum. So this is part of the digestive tract where the small intestine becomes the large intestine. So you can see here on the highlighted portion of the diagram here, as we're getting from small intestine to large intestine, this is the cecum, that highlighted part. In many herbivores, it stores bacteria to break down tough cellulose from plant material. Again, we don't quite have as developed a cecum compared to herbivores, so we aren't able to take lots of plant material and break it down a lot. Cellulose is the stuff that's in like celery that gives it a lot of its shape and its firmness. So again, imagine trying to eat plants like that for all of your meals. It'd be very difficult, but herbivores can manage it. In humans, um, the cecum has the appendix attached to it. So here we're seeing vermiform appendix, this little area right here. This is another organ that stores bacteria. And again, some people have had this removed. It's it's not essential for a human being to have it in order to live, but it does store helpful bacteria that help with digestion overall. And here, if we do a comparison between um, a human and a type of herbivorous animal, in this case a rabbit, we can see that the cecum is a lot more developed, this part right here. And again, I apologize because um, I'm not familiar with the language that this diagram is uh, being shown in, but I thought it was a really good picture for it. This is the developed cecum on a herbivore. Here's our little cecum by comparison here on a human being. So again, these structures are not to scale, but it's to try and show relative to body size that a lot of herbivores have this huge cecum compared to our little tiny cecum. Again, since we're omnivores, we can get some digestion from other materials other than plants. Let me move my video here again to talk about mammary glands. So. We're going to talk about different exocrine glands, and this particular slide focuses on mammary glands. Exocrine glands secrete substances through a duct. So with mammary glands, again, mammary has to do with mammals, so this is pretty obvious as to what it's linked to with mammals. Mammary glands are what help produce milk to feed young mammals. So we see several different examples of mammals feeding on milk. 
They can be arranged in organs such as breasts or others. Again, it just depends on the type of animal. So here's another set of exocrine glands. These are scent or musk glands. These are ones that produce secretions with pheromones or other odor-based compounds. So this is one of the forms of mammalian communication that has to do with smell. Um, some of the things that they can communicate are things like mood, sexual cycling to talk about whether or not they're in a certain point in which they're ready to breed, or defining territory. They can be located on different parts of the body. So between the toes, on the forehead, on the hind legs. So we see an example of one of those that the arrow is pointing to right there. In front of the eye. So again, this depression here in front of an eye is also a type of scent gland or musk gland that we're seeing there. Inside the nostril, near the anus. So if we're talking about anal glands, um, this is an example of an anal gland in a dog that is suffering from an infection, which is why it's more swollen and obvious. But um, again, if you've ever heard about having your dog's anal glands expressed, that's what they're referring to, are these glands that are on either side of the anus. Or they can be near the genitals. So again, these are in a lot of different locations. It just depends on the mammal. Another exocrine gland are the sebaceous or oil glands. These open into a hair follicle and secrete sebum. It's basically the oil that lubricates hair and skin. So again, you can see here's the sebaceous gland attached onto this hair follicle here that's growing from the dermis. So um, they're very, very closely tied in to hair follicles. Sebum can also help form part of earwax and tears. So again, if we think of more specialized sebaceous glands, they are involved um, with the production of earwax and tears. Not exclusively, but they help contribute to it. They also help lubricate mammary glands. So again, if we're thinking back to where young mammals are going to suckle milk from, also, excess sebum can form acne in humans, and humans are actually the only mammal that I'm aware of that have that condition, so it's kind of a unique feature to us. Lucky us. And then finally here, we're looking at the sudoriferous glands. These are ones that produce sweats. You can um, already see, like here on the pores of a human being, it's pretty obvious when we're talking about sweat. It may be less obvious in other mammals because there are a lot of mammals that have alternative strategies for this, which let me move my video so we can talk about that a little bit. But horses are another good example of an animal that sweats quite a bit. Um, so these are examples of some horses that have a lot of sweat piling onto their fur there. Sweat can help with evaporative body cooling, and this is mostly in primates where we're seeing slightly less hair in certain areas like with us. So again, <clears throat> here we're seeing the sweat gland opening up into a pore on the skin. The whole idea is that if you are releasing liquid onto your body here, once um, breezes kind of pass over it, it helps with that evaporative cooling. It basically makes it to where um, the heat is sort of wicked away from the body to allow us to cool down. Um, since mammals can produce their own body heat, it helps when they have a system like this to help them cool down. Mammals with fewer sudoriferous glands cool down by having blood vessels and big ears, like elephants or jackrabbits. They may do panting, like dogs. If you've ever seen a dog on a hot day, you know what panting is. Um, shedding seasonal hair, again, as they move through different seasons, sometimes they may lose a coat. Or wallowing in mud and water, like hippopotamuses and pigs happen to do. So again, I hope that this helps to clarify some of the physical features that we see on mammals. Um, a lot of these are a little bit more distinct in things that we tend to see more on mammals than other animals. So keep those in mind whenever you're trying to analyze mammals and figure out some aspects of their physical characteristics.